Welcome everyone to the 2011 version of an NMC tradition that goes back all the way to the beginning of our organization. We're going to have one of our presenters today has done an, a five minutes of fame at every conference now for 10 years. <clears throat> we'll let you know who that is at the appropriate time. <clears throat> this is uh, a trademarked event, actually, um, that we, we own the name <laughs> as much as you can own a name like that, Five Minutes of Fame. Uh, you should have gotten a program as you came in, and um, we will present the sessions in this order. How many of you have been to a Five Minutes of Fame presentation before? Okay, they're fun. In fact... Uh, it's amazing how much you can learn in five minutes. Now, <clears throat> to do a five minutes of fame presentation uh, requires a lot of practice and skill and preparation. And these folks have actually been in this room for the last two hours getting ready for this, which we liken to a Rockettes performance. And want to get the kicks all exactly the right height and the arm movements just exactly right. But also, we need to have someone with the wisdom and experience, the maturity, the, the depth <laughs> in the role, <laughs> in the role of the gong master. And you know, we, we looked far and wide. It's by tradition it comes from the host institution. And, you know, the University of Wisconsin community is, is big and lots of talent there. But one name rose to the top of the list. <laughs> John Staley is our gong master. Please join me. <laughs> thank you, John. And thank you for the years of practice that have brought you to this moment. We appreciate it. If you've read the book Outliers, you know it takes an average of 10,000 hours of practice to be good at anything. So there you go. So he's got 9,999 left. <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> exactly. Now, one of the uh, traditional roles that the gong master holds is that of the official timekeeper. And so John will also be counting the time, and if he says it's five minutes, it's five minutes. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the rule. There's only one other rule in Five Minutes of Fame, and that is show videos, but you can't only show a five minute video. That's not allowed. You have to actually also do other stuff. So I also want to recognize that this year we have people from <clears throat> really uh, a wide range of places, but I also like to, to know we have representatives from Singapore with us, all the way from Singapore for five minutes of fame. <clears throat> the first time that nation has been represented in this esteemed event, and we're so happy to have you here. Thank you. All right, so with no further ado, Mr. Hicks, please introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Larry. Are we all ready for this to begin? Yes. All right. Uh, our first of nine speakers is uh, Dave Gagnon from University of Wisconsin-Madison, and his presentation is 2011 Eris Global Game Jam. Let the games begin. Howdy, Mark. You got set? Go. Great. So Eris is a free and open tool for creating mobile locative experiences in games. It's funded by these people in part. Uh, different people have been in different phases of it, but it's uh, used all over the place. There's about 700 games that have been made in it by about 500 people over the last 12 months since we launched it. What it allows you to do is take places like this and put virtual characters in them, um, kind of like a role-playing game, like World of Warcraft, but outside. You can interact with those kinds of characters, exchange items, do things like that. You can also take places like this and resituate historical media in those places. You can also have your students run activities and games that require them to go collect data, like recordings of, uh, of anything. We found that this little board, which costs about 20 bucks, allows us to hook into um, anything that you can do in a museum. Usually they're called interactives. So now we can respond to and actually change the physical environment from our virtual game. 
And we're also noticing that in a lot of environments like that, QR codes just don't fit in. They're ugly, they look kind of funny, and they're so 2011. So instead what we're doing is uh, <laughs> doing image matching. So anything can become an index to any virtual item. Now with Ajax, which is a new feature that came just this week, any content that you have that's on the web or can respond to web calls can be integrated with a game. And I'm really curious to see what people will do with that. This is what it looks like to author it, and we think anybody can author this kind of stuff. And to put that to the test, recently we did a global game jam that involved everybody from professionals in the field of media design all the way down to eighth graders. So I'm gonna show you a clip from that. <laughs> Well, I'm so excited you all came. Welcome to the 2011 Eris Global Game Jam. This is the first time we've done this. We've got a dozen locations uh, in four different countries that are gonna be making 50 games with us in 50 hours. I think that Eris and uh, similar things are going to be huge in education moving forward because it really engages the people, both who create the games and those who use it, at a deeper level than a lot of traditional education does. I think we're going to see mobile technologies and gaming and hopefully um, industry kind of come together and figure out how we can prepare kids. And I guess just games, I think, are pretty much the, the future of how we're going to do things. What we're working on is a pretty basic idea for a game. Um, what we wanted to do was create a race between two different people who would be on the same game at the same time. At the end, you find out that it's the closest relatives to case one. Incorporating local, like, local landmarks into learning fluency in languages and things that you need more interaction to learn. Not every campus that has a group like this that's working on mobile technologies. This is a really special um, and exciting uh, project. One of the visions of ARIS, which is the idea of, of creating an open source platform, but also um, starting to cultivate a community of designers that are going to carry this um, open source platform into the future. The reason that I'm interested in gaming in specific, sometimes it gets boring to teach the same way over and over and over again. I think the prototypes are going to tell us a lot more about mobile learning than a product is. And that's really um, something that you can only do in this environment. Uh, let's try telling stories in new ways. Let's come up with new ways to be engaged with a space and a place. Um, and let's think of what that really looks like. In the future of education, um, games have become a really big part of media as a whole and with all the new technology like the iPhone and iPad and being able to interact with the actual environment. It's the next place that you'll find um, a lot of the media that we create and see these days. Thanks a lot. Join us. Make games. All right, thank you. Our next presenter is Mike Reese with Johns Hopkins University, and his presentation is Bridging the Micro and Macro World with Blender and Legos. Hi, my name is Mike Reese, and I'm the assistant director in the Center for Educational Resources, which is an instructional innovation group on the undergraduate campus at Johns Hopkins. And our center awards mini grants to faculty, uh, student teams to develop new resources for courses. And so I want to tell you about one of these today. It's a, it's a tool to help students understand the physics behind fluid mechanics and how to apply this to developing nanotechnology. 
So nanotech is the engineering of functional systems at the molecular level. And fluid mechanics is the study of fluids, and this could be gases or liquids, and the forces that are acting on them. So nanotechnology is taught in a lot of different courses and a lot of different departments on our campus. This was particularly developed for a chemical and biomolecular engineering course called separation processes. And so this is a course that's looking at how do we engineer devices to separate out uh, mixed fluids or solids. So for example, let's say you've got a, um, a uh, sample of blood and you want to separate it out into different components so that you can then analyze those different components for various things. This is a course where you're learning how to do that. And it's actually very difficult for the students. There's a lot of physics and math that's involved. And more important, a lot of these processes are happening at the molecular level or at, at micro levels. Uh, so it's hard for them to really see what's going on. So uh, there's actually an opportunity that comes out of this class and that one of the concepts that they learn is called scaling. And this is the idea that two systems of disparate dimensions, so one that's micro and one that's macro, exhibit the same behavior. And so what this allows us to do is show students physically what's going on with something in a macro system and they can understand what's happening at the micro level. So the faculty, Joel Frechette and uh, Hermann Drazer, realized this and developed a two-phase simulation for teaching students this separation processes content. And it involves uh, using Blender, which is an open source 3D content creation tool, along with some Legos. And um, we had two star student developers, Christian Pick and Sylvia Sohn, and this is, this is how it works. So this is a screenshot of the uh, Blender simulation. So what students do is after they learn the content, they're presented this simulator, and they hypothesize about what are the critical angles that we can set this, this is a screening device, what critical angles do we tilt this at, what uh, fluids do we fill it with, that and these fluids would have different viscosity, and they then test it out with the simulation, and then they continue to work on it until they figure out what those critical characteristics are to get the separation that they're looking for. So let me show you real quick how this operates. So this is it right here. And my computer is quite old, and this has a lot of calculations that are going on, so it's very slow. But you can see that I can tilt this back and forth and change different characteristics. And ideally what happens is the large, uh, large objects will filter to one side because of the way they're bouncing around this grid, and the small objects are going to move to the left side. So once the students have played around with this, they get their characteristics right, they then move on to the second phase where they can actually see this in action. So that's where we roll out this bad boy. This is a Lego board with a number of cylinder Legos attached to it to create the screening device. It's enclosed in plexiglass so we can fill it with different fluids like water or glycerol. And it's attached to an arm in the back that you can't see so we can actually rotate this thing 360 degrees. And so students can take the numbers they get out of the uh, simulation, the blender simulation, and set this up and try it, uh, try it with uh, something they can actually see. So let me show you a quick video of how that works. So you can see here that the large objects are moving to the right, the others are going to the left, and this angle here, I think the trick for this was glycerol is about 30 degrees, um, allows them to check it out. So if you're thinking Plinko, that's exactly what this is. This is the physics of Plinko right here. So um, the thing that turned out to be great about this is it didn't just work for our undergraduates, but it works for little kids as well. So we took this to the US Engineering and Science Festival in Washington DC last fall, and we let these eight to 14 year old kids, we had a couple thousand that came through, play around with the Lego board, play around with the blender simulator, and it worked out great. I mean, these kids didn't understand the math and the physics that was going on behind it, but you know, it was interesting to watch even these little kids really get these separation concepts. Um, and more important, they got a sense of what engineers are doing, how they're designing different devices using these thought experiments that are out there. So with that, I want to thank the Smart Family Foundation for funding our little mini-grant program, and I thank Legos. They ended up... Wonderful. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, our third presentation is uh, Vivian from the Nanyang Technical University and Henry from the National University of Shang oh, excuse me, Singapore, excuse me, uh, and they're Presentation is a collaborative augmented reality game for your mobile.
Hi everyone, Simon Henry Du, uh, head of the Mobile Interactive Media Entertainment Laboratory at the Uni National University of Singapore, and this is my colleague, Dr. Vivian Chen. Hi everybody. Um, the presentation today, um, basically we want to introduce you some of the work we've been doing in this Mimi Lab in the US. Uh, in US. Sorry, I don't know why I say that. Um, and then basically the focus of the group is um, to look at mobile application and how we could actually uh, use a, ver a variety of media, mediums actually to um, make games that would actually facilitate learning and campus life. So the team has about more than 15 researchers from uh, multidiscipline um, as well as multi-countries. And we've got um, more than US, about three million funding um, to do a variety of the work uh, in this area. And then some of the applications that we're gonna show you today have won some awards from um, like CGRAF and KITE, this kind of uh, big engineering conferences. We're also working with a variety of schools in the US. Um, and then basically the focus of the research is on mobile application and we focus on entertainment and education for not only the children but also elderly. Um, and this is just some of the work we've done and here's the video. Um, that basically in this video, uh, we will show you three applications we developed that's targeting towards learning purposes. And also learning, uh, we believe that when you learn something, it's best to learn when you're with somebody, uh, whether it's your teacher or it's your peers. So, um, and then using um, the mobile augmented reality system actually allows learning to be seamless. It's either in the classroom or out of the classroom. So the first application is what we call the mobile AR campus. It's essentially of a, more of a, a navigation kind of system. It's called Mobile AR Circuit. Um, so basically, what you can see there are two screens. So a, a student can have an iPhone and a teacher can have an iPad. They're going to be seeing the same thing. Um, but whatever um, that's going on on both of the screen, they like simultaneously would show up on the screen. So the teacher and the student don't necessarily have to be in the same space. Um, they can still see what's going on uh, on each other's screen. And then so the teacher are able to help the student to design the right kind of circuit. And this one's called Mobile AR Urban Planning. Um, this is a game which actually basically that the student to take a role on an urban planner. So you're, the students are able to actually give a, a value of uh, adjusting um, the different parts of the city. And you students are able to use the iPhone. Either you could go through the city virtually or actually physically. And this one's called Micro AR. Um, so the idea is um, because augmented reality allows uh, so sort of uh, people to go through either the paper medium or the phone. So the idea is if you say, if you look at the video, it's an encyclopedia. Um, but with the phone, you are actually able to see um, the object um, embedded within that, um, that's a cabbage, okay, itself. phone goes to recognize the marker, um, the object would actually show. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So all of the above um, applications were uh, basically made based on the Scheme Engine, and we made it open source. Thank you. 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 Thank
and then a walk through it so it just takes them screen at a time through first you do this then you do this then you do this here's the slide share finally number five um, my favorite, which is literary magazines, I work with MFA students in creative writing, and we've been building a nice collection of literary magazines for them, and I really want them to know what we have so that they come and look at it. And so one of my things I'm most excited about, at the very basic, this does that. It's just a list of all the literary magazines we have, and that makes me pretty happy as it is. However, um, these link to the websites of the literary magazines, and most of the magazines have a... <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. Our fifth presenter is uh, John Hildreth from Radford College, and he's doing floating arguments, adapting a board game to a smart board. All right, I'm going to tell you about a game I adapted, a computer game from a board game. Now, before I got involved in this, floating arguments was designed as a board game. Uh, by my colleague, uh, Dr. Guy Axtell, who teaches in philosophy and religion. And he designed this game to help him teach argument evaluation in his philosophy classes. Um, that is determining whether a given argument is deductive or inductive. And if you've ever studied any of this or seen it, you know this can be difficult, maybe dry, and just heady logical material. And so instead of students just trying to memorize the concept, he wanted to create a way that forced them to analyze arguments and think for themselves. And so he created this board game. And this is a facsimile of how it works. Uh, it's a magnetized board. It's set up as a flow chart. You start at the top and you work your way down. You kind of start with generalities and then it goes down to real world scenarios. Each level has an answer set. Uh, each answer has a game piece. You move it to the area of the level you think it goes. And you move on to the next level. Similarly, you have game pieces. And so I saw this and I asked him, I said, well, you teach in a multimedia classroom. What would happen if we adapted this in like a video game version or a computer game and you could have a colorful interface and sounds and uh, you could use a smart board in your room to play it. Do you think that might raise the engagement a, a little bit? Do you think they might even like it better? We talked about it and we said, yeah, let's try it. And so I started thinking about, okay, how am I gonna adapt this and ran into some pretty serious uh, challenges. For one thing, uh, the game board's actually fairly long, but it all has to fit in the same interface. If you break it up into screens, it starts to feel too much like a quiz. Then you have the answer sets for each level. Somehow that information's all got to go in the interface, and then game pieces, you know, what do you do with that? Um, so these are some pretty significant challenges. So after a couple of months of prototyping, uh, we came up with a beta version, and um, you're going to see some gameplay here, and I'm just going to kind of talk over it. Um, the flowchart was adapted, as you see here, using uh, Adobe Flash and ActionScript 3. Um, using a scroller, we could fit the whole thing in there. And starting from the top down, uh, you have level one. You get a nice sound and applause if you get it right. You can scroll through the answer sets in a scrollable text box. Um, but if you do get a wrong answer, the game laughs at you. Um, so, a little bit of humiliation you know, can, is good. Um, see, there you go. And it tells you you're wrong and it takes a point away too. Uh, so anyway, um, everything, we wanted to get everything in the same interface. And it was a challenge, especially with this kind of material. You finish a level, the next one unlocks. So you have to go level by level. You can't just go through willy-nilly and try and play it. So, back to the question, did this raise the engagement? Uh, and actually, yes, it did. Um, we ran a pilot in which the students uh, were broken up into groups, and we did a time trial. We started a timer, and so they were working against each other, uh, and nobody wanted to be the team that came in last. So as soon as the team finished a level, whoever did it first went up and tried their hand at playing the game on the board. And they actually had a lot of fun with it, and everybody wanted to see everybody else get laughed at in the game. Uh, so, and then, and then if you got it wrong, you had to sit down and then the next student came up and did it. So this actually made a huge difference in how the students understood these really dense, logical, philosophical concepts. And there's Dr. Axel going over the game. Okay, this is uh, currently in beta as of March of this year. Um, we're still taking input from users on how it can be better. Uh, so you can go to radford.edu slash CITL play it online or download a standalone version for Flash Player. Um, if you want to talk about it or have questions, um, feel free to email me. Thank you.
right, thank you so much. Our next presentation is Ideas, Challenges, Solutions by Holly Ludgate, Sh uh, Sharon Gabriel, Roxanne DeLeon, and Sue Bedard of Full Sail University. Enjoy. Good afternoon. Um, we are absolutely passionate about challenge-based learning because um, we want you all to remember that we answer to the children in the seats and that's what we're all here for. So um, here's our journey with Apple and NMC CBL's pilot program. This is Sue. She is a teacher. She has lots of ideas, thoughts, and questions. But no one to talk to. No one to work with to affect change. Her peers are either too busy, not nearby, or no space to meet. She thinks, how can I share my thoughts? How can I meaningfully collaborate with others? Ah. Can you? Can you foster virtual community? Typically in Nings, you see people get excited for a couple days and then they, they phase out or they never even sign up. But with the Ning put together for the CBL pilot, we've really seen a lot of interactivity and we've seen a lot of the participants actually working with each other rather than just coming back to me or to Sue or to Roxanne for answers. They're really trying to negotiate, vent, figure out things, and see commonalities um, with people's projects and how their CBL is comparing to others. My name is Erin Lotus. I am a teacher in Urbana, Illinois at Urbana Middle School. My name is Tom Krauswitz, and I'm a teacher at DeMatha High School in Hyattsville, Maryland. Hello, my name is Katie Krieger, and I am a science teacher at Marymount School of New Hi, York. I'm Kathleen Stallnaker. I teach at McCray High School in West Central Minnesota. Hi, my name is Danny Brayer. I teach at Covenant Christian High School. My name is Kara Ellerthorpe, and I teach her intermediate school. Aloha, I'm Joanna Baniaga, a part-time faculty member at Hanalani Schools. trash produced on our campus. How can community college students be better prepared to compete for global jobs? I am challenging us to find out what apathy is and transform apathy into engagement in reading. Our, Our challenge. challenge. Our challenge. Our, Our challenge. challenge. Reduce the amount of paper our school uses. Can you reduce the amount of paper your school uses? Our big idea? Sustainability. Transform our piles of paper to clouds of content that are easier on our backs and our environment. I think we've cited something really great here that has the potential to promote educational change and improvement. Who does this challenge impact? All of this not only impacts the students at Osceola, students all over this country, adults all over this country, everybody on this earth. Recycling impacts everybody. Hands off in a challenge-based process with students. Uh, your temptation is to be really prescriptive, to tell them exactly what to do to get the job done, and, and really that would defeat the purpose of the challenge in the first place. I learned that challenge-based learning is a very uniquely practical way of learning because it doesn't just require students to come up with answers to problems just to get an A in class. It requires them to come up with solutions for real-world issues that can actually be applied. The 
this CBL pilot project has been, really been transformational for us and definitely for the students that have collaborated with us in this. And we are looking forward to actually our next round that they have pushed us to start doing. To keep my eye on you. <laughs> so after about uh, six weeks of no sleep, we had 31 projects, 31 challenges, almost 31 solutions, and we created collaborative, creative thinkers for tomorrow. Thank you, Full Sail. Well done. Uh, our next presentation is from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, we have Lisa Jansen, Mina Zia, and Lauren Cruz doing Launch a Social Media inter Internship Program today, like right now, in five minutes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Jansen, and I'm here with our two social media interns. This is Lauren Cruz. She'll be a senior this fall in international studies. And Mina Zia just graduated with a degree in political science. We all work for LNS Learning Support Services. I'll tell you a little bit about Learning Support Services first. We provide instructional technology support and facilities to the UW-Madison College of Letters and Science. We have about 14 full-time employees and 25 student hourly employees. And one thing I'd like to note is that our students often have time during their regularly scheduled shifts to work on special projects, and that's when our social media interns worked on their social media projects. Doug Warsham really got it all started. He's pictured in the middle here in this picture. Our goal with social media has always been to build and engage community. We use a variety of platforms, including our website, Twitter, Facebook, and Foursquare, and we always use a variety of media, including text links, photos, video, questions, and polls. And now we'd like to show you a couple of examples. So this is an example of our Twitter page. Um, we learned early on that if you just tweet random information, everyone just thinks you're boring and no one wants to read them. So um, instead, we found the lolcats in Spanish. And since we're into language learning at LSS, we decided to tweet about it. Um, and we ended up getting four retweets in 30 minutes. So um, that was a really good way to get some recognition. Um, polls and discussions are a great way to engage your audience, and this is an example of one of our discussion tabs on our Facebook page where we asked our audience to um, contribute their haikus. So here you have three elevators, motionless, quiescent, cold, up and down we climb. So we thought it was funny, and other people liked it too, and we got a lot of interaction. Thanks. So Mina, what makes you guys so good at what you do? Well, Lisa... Um, <laughs> the main, one of the main things that um, really helped us was the fact that we go nuts when we're together and we're just like, oh, let's do this, let's do this, let's tweet about this thing, you know, and everyone else thinks we're crazy, but we get it out there and people respond well to us because they just are like, who are those nutso girls that are tweeting for LSS? <laughs> um, and we also already had an interest in social media, um, but even if you don't have someone who already has an interest in social media um, where you are, it's really easy. Students these days are all on Twitter, they're on Facebook, so it's really easy to get people engaged, um, especially people who already work in your department. Mm -hmm. Lauren, what made our internship work for you? Having a well-known purpose between your team is very crucial for this, just so you know who you're trying to talk to and what your message is is very important. Also, like we said, we are a part of a team, which I personally really liked because we get to bounce ideas off of each other and constantly check up on what works and what doesn't. Also, um, our bosses were really cool. They allowed us to be creative and tr go with our ideas, which you know, in the end brought us a lot of success and some tools that can help you um, are like tweet deck, co, co tweet, and hoot suite, which um, allow you to schedule out your tweets so if you're not there all the time, you can still do your job. Mina, what role does the social media community play in our social media efforts? Um, well, the community is actually. Obviously, the whole reason you do Twitter and Facebook is because you want a community interaction. Um, luckily, Madison's great about Twitter and Facebook, and everyone in Madison is doing it, and so are all the departments. Um, and an example over there is um, fo Follow Friday, um, where people decide, like, hey, they have a cool Twitter. I'm going to tell all my followers to follow them, too. Um, and we got followed a lot 
with the community. Um, so it's a great way to expand your audience, retweet other people, even if you think they don't know you exist. Um, if you show interest in someone else, they're gonna show interest in you, like Facebook pages, just try and stay connected with the community and it's really beneficial. We also learn through our community um, certain tips and two of our favorite tips are um, the way you phrase your tweets or Facebook posts are really important. If you want more interaction, you might want to ask a question, therefore people will respond. And that was really, really helpful for us. And then also something to think about is maybe to um, do posts or tweets at the beginning of the hour, halfway through the hour, something like that, because that's usually when people are looking at your stuff. We would love to talk to you more about our internship program, so please see us after this presentation. You can also look us up on our website, lss.wisc.edu. Follow us on Twitter, at UWLSS, <laughs> or uh, like us on Facebook, LNS Learning Support Services. And we have a wonderful intern for hire, just graduated. She's Shame fabulous, Nina Zia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, social media gurus. So this next presenter needs no introduction, but I'm gonna give him one anyway. Now, Jared Bendis, this is his 10th five minutes of fame. So ladies and gentlemen, this is what 10, this is what a decade of five minutes of fame has culminated to. He's gonna be presenting Tweet My Paper, an experiment in Facebook writing. Thank you, thank you. All right, all right, now uh, let's see, tweeting from the podium at the NMC five minutes of fame. What's the hashtag here? NM NMC 11. NMC 11, did I, did I make a typo in there? Oh my God, here we go, so tweet, so there we go. Don't you hate people who Twitter when they shouldn't? Text message for the hell of it. And this is what we're, we're surrounded by this, right? The kids are text messaging in class. They're just going, hey, I hate getting texted. I always tell people when you get texted, it's my way of saying, I know exactly where you are. I know how to reach you. I just really want your response. And I think this is a shouting match, right? We shout, we shout, we shout one line at a time. You can't take it back. But as teachers, what are we saying? Revise, edit, plan. So I was thinking with my students, how do I mix these two together? And so I wrote an app called tweetmypaper.com. Word processing meets text messaging. So it, at tweetmypaper.com, what I invite you to do is write your papers one line at a time in 140 character increments, and you can't edit and you can't go back. For the old folks in this room, it's called a typewriter. But for the rest of you, <laughs> This is what we do with our students. Now, I have set up a brand new uh, Facebook account just to play with this. So I'm going to come over here and connect to Facebook. And it's going to go, what is your name? My name is Jared Test at AOL.com. Don't try to email me here. Uh, I don't really check this. By the way, they, telemarketers know, what's your email address, sir? It's Jared Test at, oh, yeah, that's, that's it. All right, so I'm going to log in. And it's going to go, may I? And you say yes. By the way, if the first 25 of you who say yes means I can make this public on Facebook. All right, so I come over here and I allow it, and all of a sudden it is, I am and tweet my paper. I am now a connected registered user. By the way, I'm playing without a net here. This is live. Let's hope this works. Don't worry, I have a backup plan. Not really. Um, how am I doing? Keep up the good work. There's more of those dollars there, you know. All right. Um, <laughs> So anyway, so my students are about two-thirds of the way through their new media literacy course. They are given certain opportunities. They are told they have to tweet their paper. The first paper has to be 30 tweets long. It's about the average length of a paper. And it has to be about a, um, a virtual world. Where would they be? Who would they be? What would they be doing? So I'm going to come over here, and I am going to – look, it didn't connect me. Let's try that again. Ooh, this will be fun. And while it's trying to connect me, I'm going to come over here and show you one of my fine students' uh, papers. Here we go. I'm going to create a new paper instead because I can do that. The title of the paper is Howdy, Howdy, Howdy. And, of course, I'm going to post a new news item on my Facebook wall. Look, I actually let you not do that as well because I'm a nice Facebook app writer. All right, so I'm going to create a new paper. And, of course, right now it just tweeted on my – it just did that. And I can, now I can add a line. Once there was a conference called the – NMC, doop, 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 typo, 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 add line, great. It was the greatest conference, oops, that can be. All right, and we continue, we continue, and of course, if I wanted to, I could close the paper, and that's it. Once a paper is closed, 
I can no longer edit it. Now, if I'd left it open, I could edit it for as long as I wanted to. Let's take a look at one of my students' papers real fast. Once upon a time, there's a man named Gal Gal Galbatorix who lived within the confines of one of the most powerful realms known to mankind. Timestamp, April 19th, 11.05 a.m. He resided in the land of, oh my God, timestamp, April 19th, 10.46 p.m. I always imagined that he was staring at the screen for 11 hours. <laughs> Um, but anyway, it really is endearing when you see little typos and stuff. So after he does this, this paper, he had to do another one on the Teddy Ruck. Oh, no, I'm going to skip to that one next. He had to do another one on this little Teddy Ruxpin uh, doll of his. And, and he, I don't have that one up. And at one point, I'd say, by the time I'm doing this, we're prepping for the term paper. And somebody goes, uh, Mr. Bendis, do we have to tweet our term papers? No. That's what editing is about. And they suddenly see the value of editing because they don't like doing it this way. So it's, an, it's experimental writing, and I invite you all to do it at tweetmypaper.com. Look, Derek Toten, who's not here but might want to be known that he's being mentioned, he actually, uh, when he found out about this a few years ago when I first did it as a Twitter app, he wrote this little Madonna of the Strawberry Field. So you can do all sorts of little things by this, and when it's done, and when I'm done, if I go back to my papers, I can come over here to my account, and I can come over here and I can say post paper as Facebook note. At this point, it has posted on my Facebook wall. And if I come back to my Facebook and hope that it's working, it will say that tweet my paper and it will see that it has been posted there for all my friends to see. So again, I invite all of you to visit tweetmypaper.com and enjoy. Send your students, send your assignments. And if there's bugs, well, send those too. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Uh, our ninth and last presentation is Elizabeth Pyatt from the um, Pennsylvania State University. Uh, her presentation is Typos. Jared, you might want to get this. Typos, the game to destroy all grammar errors. The game is, how quickly can I get to the demo? And this is Typo, an educational word arcade game developed at Penn State by the Educational Gaming Commons. We develop educational games. In this case, um, our faculty lead was Bim Angst, an instructor. Jason Wolf was our program. He can't be here, but he did a lot with this. I'm Elizabeth Pite. I'm the instructional designer, and I think we did a great job. So go team. This is time, by the way. <laughs> All right. Um, the scenario is a beginning English composition course. Students need a lot of proofreading practice. I think all of you have English comp courses and know this. And you also know that students hate proofreading. So the idea is, can we make this a fun game? And what we did is um, the mechanics, it's a scrolling time text. Click on typos for valuable points. Lose points if you have an incorrect guess, just like the SAT. We have a scoreboard um, so we can see who's proofing the fastest and most accurately. And our instructor wrote a great storyline across multiple texts. It's a spooky mystery, lots of moons. Student surveys say it's good practice for grammar quizzes, more fun than quizzes. Um, many enjoyed the storyline that our instructor wrote. And the uh, interesting com comment is it moves really fast. <laughs> Do you want to slow it or keep it a challenge? It's up to you. <laughs> We did find a statistically significant difference in pre-test uh, pre versus post-test scores for a gaming versus non-gaming section that happened last semester. It was very exciting. But I think what you really want to see is the game. And so uh, we're going to play typo, and it um, is tied into our authentication system, and also to Google ID. There we go. And we're going to experimenting with this. So um, I'm in multiple courses, so I want to be in my course, and I want to play a game. And the game, this is taken from a real life forum on a reality TV show. We have uh, original music by another programmer, TK Lee. So identify non-standard English, feel free to shout out. Like 
this. E. <laughs> See, this one doesn't look like it's going fast, but <laughs> that's how fast it goes. <laughs> and 25%, so I would recommend replaying this. And since I do have time, I can show you we do have a manage content, so we uh, can add content. So you can set up a course. Um, we had a sample with the Spanish course. They were testing for vocabulary. Law school's interested for testing technical vocabulary. Um, lots of things where you're just looking for uh, through a text and identifying what's right and what's wrong. And so I have time. I have to make sure my course is published so I can create another exercise. But let's just go with yet another Thing. So we can say where the source of the text is and keywords, and we can use metadata, although we haven't really had a chance to do that yet. And there's the text, and I'm, I'm done editing, and then wherever I find an error, I drag and drop. So you do have to test this um, and make sure you actually have all the errors identified. So I think I'm good. <laughs> and I've hit all the smiley faces, so I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and I got through it. <laughs> Four and a half minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give another hand for everybody presenting. Let's have all the presenters come back up, please.